Hello, hello. Welcome, Morgan, to the Mom Force podcast. We're so happy you're here. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I really am. <laughs> Well, Morgan, you are all of the things, a poet, <laughs> an artist, a musician, a writer, and an inspiration for so many, so accomplished, and you're a mother on top of it all. <laughs> I am. That is true. <laughs> well, it is such yes. a treat to have you here today to chat with and hear more about your work and your latest book and to learn from you. I like to start each interview here on the podcast with a question to help kind of pull back the curtain a little bit um, and see what your real life looks like. Um, and since we're all about photos here at Chatbooks, yes. I was wondering, is there a photo in your camera roll that doesn't quite tell the full story of the moment? And oh, if so, yes. will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's actually a, a selfie that I took. Um, I forget what the ride itself it's called, but it's on a, a ride at Disney World, and I'm in one of the. It's like a. It's in like the. Tom, maybe it's called Tomorrowland. I forget. I don't mm -hmm. know. But the futuristic part of the park, and it's just this ride that kind of takes you in circles. And I took like the most mediocre selfie of myself. And behind me though is is my husband and my son. You can't even see his face. It's just this curly hair. But for me, it's just it, the photo just makes it's so mediocre. And I think that's why I love it <laughs> because I used to be a photographer of uh, for a while, and I really value good photos and good lighting and the story and what story can you tell in the photo and I'm like oh my gosh if anybody else in the world saw this photo no one would stop to look at it twice because it's it's yeah. just so ordinary and that's what I love about it because it's to me it's it's a reminder that like to myself somebody who was very visually minded I mean I think in visuals I'm an artist like all these things but it's just like, yeah, sometimes you just take mediocre photos of bad lighting and there's so much rich story to them. So yes, I, I just the, love that photo. <laughs> I love that. And it is called Tomorrowland. I used to work at Disney oh, World. So I worked know, at entertainment. You know, I know. You know the all the facts. Well. <laughs> but I also know that life is full of a lot of ordinary moments, yes. even if you happen to be on a ride at Disney World. But exactly. All of that woven together creates the beautiful like rich picture that makes yes. up our lives. Oh my goodness. Yes. So, so good. Okay. This is actually reminds me, I heard somewhere you were talking about the inspiration for one of your earlier books, um, how far you have come mm -hmm. that that inspiration came from looking at your camera roll. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah. So on the kind of the opposite spectrum of like taking photos with my phone, it, taking beautiful photos with my phone was, I feel like, such an important thing for me when I was in my 20s because I was so creative and I had so many dreams and so many things I wanted to do, but like no money whatsoever, <laughs> just no resources to bring the things to life. And it's interesting now because, you know, even, you know, today there's so many new creative ways to just get your work out there and there's new apps coming out all the time that help you do things that weren't even possible, you know, a year or two ago. But back then, you know, technology, I mean, iPhones are just kind of becoming a thing. Like technology was just getting started in a lot of ways, you know, at least in terms of mobile phones. And that was like the only thing I had that I felt like I could really, really push the boundaries of my creativity. And we were driving through New Mexico one morning. This is back when I was a touring musician, which sounds way more glamorous than it was. Like it does. we were just we were just like <laughs> in like in like a car, like just trying to get from one venue to the next. And we were crossing through New Mexico and we never got to play any shows in New Mexico hardly. Like that's the other sad thing. It's like we we're literally just driving through and it was so beautiful. And we're woke up at like 4 a.m. probably to drive and everyone's you know just kind of groggy and making their way through and I took this photo where we're leaving Albuquerque and kind of going into the more rural part of New Mexico and it's just the canyons were opening up and the sun was rising and it was just so beautiful it was like the cool color of the blue sky the warm canyons it was just the warm and the cool and the light everything was it was just perfect it was just perfect and mm. I was just so in love with this photo that I took and so proud of it. I did nothing with it. It was just there on my phone. It was just a moment that I had to myself. And the color palette from that photo ended up being the color palette 
that was on my first product that I ever saw on a store display, which is a shirt that I did for anthropology. It ended up being the cover of that book. It ended up being like the base color palette for um, even the, a collection that I did recently with Hallmark, I still use that color palette all the time. And I just love, I, I just love talking about that because for me, it was like that moment. It was just a glimpse, a moment in time, something that took me a few seconds to do. And now years later, I'm seeing, I'm still seeing the ripple effects of what happened in that instance today, all from my iPhone photo. So I just... Oh, I could talk that about that so forever, but cool. yeah, you know, we talk yeah. at Chatbooks a lot about capturing the magic in everyday moments, yes. and that's literally what you did. You yes. just snapped a picture that then ended up shaping a big yes. part of your career. In fact, I think that photo might even been the inspiration for a sweatshirt that I bought my daughter Lakin, who you met earlier. Oh, She's yes. the sound engineer for the podcast here. Um, she was actually going through a really rough time a few years ago. And that's when we discovered your Instagram account mm-hmm. and found so much um, strength and comfort from the words that you you were sharing on Instagram and your art. And I bought her this sweatshirt that I think said something like, um, something about how far you had come. Yes, and yes. It, oh, so, so beautiful. <sighs> um, the piece that we found from your art at that difficult time was like such a gift for us. And <sighs> I love that your new book, is all about finding peace. Yes. The title, yes. Peace is a Practice, an Invitation to Breathe Deep and Find a New Rhythm for Life. I mean, yes. there is so much to <laughs> dig into right there. But I wanted, my start, I wanted to start by sharing this quote from your book. You say, learning to seek peace in daily life is about realizing we are worthy of peace. And it starts right here with a deep inhale and a hold nothing back exhale. And you ground yourself in the grace of the present. You don't have to arrive at your picture perfect life before you can know peace. Mm. Ah, Morgan, so, so beautiful. What made you want to write this book about peace? Yes. So I started working on this book kind of around the time I was realizing that um, I could be autistic and that I was that autism spectrum was something that had come up in my childhood, but there just weren't a lot of resources growing up to really explore that any further. But um, fast forward to a few years ago, I was just really struggling with workload, um, just trying to manage parenthood and Parenthood and work, those two mm. things combined, like those just big, take <laughs> big, big, huge <laughs> just, things. Just take those two. I'm mean, you know, add all the other stuff. Yeah. But while I'm figuring that out, the the pandemic happens and you know the lockdown starts. So I have like like my son wasn't even one yet. I, I turned thirty like two or maybe two or three weeks before the first lockdown. So uh-huh. that was sort of just like okay, like it's a milestone. Here's parenthood, turning 30, working, like it just felt like a never ending just, and I really don't like to use this word, but it's what it was. It was a grind. It just felt like a never ending grind. And then we can all relate. Yeah. And then yes. it just kept continuing and growing. And then even just, just being a, a, a black artist and author, you know, during that summer of 2020, there was a mm-hmm. lot that people well-intentioned people were well-intentioned but asking a lot of (laughs) of of black creators to like speak to the moment and it's just like we're tired we're so tired so I was just coming off of months and months of just really just trying to keep my head above water and just feeling like I couldn't find that room to breathe and one day I just have I just sort of um, like a lot of times people ask me, how do you even find time to create? I'm like, I have to really just kind of claim it. And, and it's a risk. It's like, every time I'm making art, I'm not doing something else. <laughs> um, yeah. and I just found this moment one day where I was just like, I want to just sit down and I'm just going to make a hundred pieces of art a day. I don't know. This is how I just cope with things. Just create more stuff. I guess <laughs> some people like to clean. I like to just doodle I guess and just keep going so I made like 100 pieces of mostly mediocre artwork in one day like I was just like I told, I told my husband I'm like watch Jacob like I, I just got to do that <laughs> I got work to do 
<laughs> and most of that work never saw the light of day. Like it's like I said, I mean, some of it's just really simple doodles because a hundred is a lot. But one of those pieces, it was a it was a blue piece that said I'd written on it. Peace is a practice. And I just posted that on my Instagram and I just kind of left it there. And then it was actually my editor who came back to me and was like, what is this? Like, what is this piece as a practice? Can you talk more about that? And when she asked me, I realized, oh, that's what I was doing back then. I was just practicing. I was inching away at, at just trying to find small things that helped me breathe through this moment. I never landed on the one big thing. I never did. And even as I got my autism diagnosis, like it wasn't just like, okay, here's your diagnosis. Now everything is going to make sense in your life and it's all going to be easy. It's not that at all, but it's like, wow, that too was a part of just inching my way through this landscape and, and slowly learning how to breathe through moments one at a time. And I, and I really felt like in some ways, you know, it was a, it was kind of a bit of a risk to even write a book about that because, you know, we live in a time where marketing is everything and, and telling your story in a short, fast way that leaves people on a cliffhanger that they want to know more. I was like, I don't know if this book is that, but I also, but I do know that this book is something for that other, for someone else who might be in that space of just feeling like they're slowly moving through the landscape and trying to learn how to breathe and find peace in each and every moment. And, and yeah, that's what that, that's how that came about. And and it's still how, how I, how I approach every day. Well, I am so grateful that you, that you wrote this book because as I was, I mean, I'm 50 years old, right? I've been through a lot of life and I've found my own coping mechanisms to deal with the grind that we yeah. all feel. Um, but as I was reading the book, I kept underlining things that I wanted to share with my kids because I want them to know these things now before mm. they're 50 and learn yeah. how to how to practice peace in their life. Because, um, you know, like as a mom, you want to swoop in and solve all the problems, right? Yeah. You know what, <laughs> kind of have a sense of what they're going through and what's ahead of them. Yes. But that is not... That's not what helps them. That's not what's best for them. Um, and I'm just curious, as a mother, your son is how old now? He's three. He's, He's three, three years three. old. Yes. <laughs> what new perspectives has motherhood brought to you, as, as you've talked about and learned about and you know, written about peace? Oh, my goodness. Yes. It, it is really just becoming a mother has really just reflected back to me how this might sound like a random answer, but I mean, it's, it's true. It's just how hard I've been on myself. Yes. Um, because I, and, and it's just, this kind of just started happening naturally. Like I, no one really told me this, but it, it just started coming up where I will have these moments where I would be hard on myself about something I didn't get done or something I, you know, forgot to respond to or whatever it is. And, and I would just think, do I want my child to be hard on himself like that? And the answer is no. And that's something that me and my husband, we talk about a lot. Like, well, we're, we're business partners. We work together. And, and these past few years have been really rough <laughs> for a lot of small business owners, like constant change, just constant things going on. And there's so many times like, well, we're like, you know what, if, if Jacob had a business, like <laughs> as an adult, like, what mm -hmm. will we be telling him? You know, how it's, it's, it's fast. It's been fascinating to me just how quickly I can go into negative self-talk. And I'm like, I don't want to pass that on. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to pass that on. And I'm, I'm very serious about that. I think it's one of the things I feel like I'm most serious about now as, as a parent. So yeah, it's just been interesting how, how that has really just changed the way I, even just the way I, I speak about, um, like there was like a commercial on TV last night that was just irritating me. <laughs> it was just like, oh, we're such a small thing that most people be like, Morgan, calm down. Um, but it was a commercial about the, the person, the commercial, the, the whole kind of point of the commercial was, um, uh, and in this, I mean, I won't name the company, but they had several commercials about this, Okay, about this, like the, the whole, it was funny, but it was like about the whole joke of the commercial was this adult who was acting like a kid. And I was like, mm -hmm. I see the joke, but it also really bothered me because I was just like, no, like 
we need more of this as yeah. adults. We need more. I'm like, I understand it's such an easy joke. And I, I see it. I see it. I see the humor in it. You know, I, I recognize that most people would see this as harmless. But like, it kind of bothers me. Like, it kind of bothers me that this concept of grow up, straighten up, have it all together. It's even in our jokes. And again, I know some people might be listening to this like, Morgan, no one cares. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But at the same time, it's like there are subtle things like that in our lives where we've, where, you know, we may have told ourselves that we need to be more adult or more responsible in some way. And it's like, but do we? <laughs> do we yeah. all the time? Um, and so, yeah, I don't have the answers for that, but it's something I, I, I think about a whole lot now. Um, my son is very creative, very inventive. He likes to, he's very fascinated with trains and is always trying to find like his own way of doing things. And sometimes I will see him try to do something that I know is implausible with wooden tracks, <laughs> mm -hmm. but then I, I hold back and say, you know what, but let him figure that out. You know, like, let me not just hop in there and say, oh no, that's not possible. Cause I was like, it's not possible here. But he also has like this, we found like this little video game that allows him to build like these really complex tracks and he's really getting into it. And some of the things that he couldn't do on the physical tracks, he can do on the game. I was like, who knows? Cool. Like he could be thinking of yeah. some new way, but maybe he comes to me at five years old, like, hey, mom, I invented, you know, yes. some, some new way of doing this. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just a way of him being curious. So I'm like, wow, I need to nurture that in him, but also in myself. Like how many times am I like, Morgan, that's not possible. Morgan, oh, you know, stop being so unrealistic. Like focus yeah. on X, Y, and Z. This is what's most important. And it's like, or let yourself be curious. Let yourself yes. say, what if? Let yourself dream and just get, creating more room for myself to do that. That's, that's yeah. been a big theme, big theme lately. Well, in your book, you talk about the power that can come from reading children's books, like allowing yes. ourselves to be more childlike <laughs> and have more yes. curiosity and wonder. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. And and I can totally relate with what you're saying about how I know when I had my children, too, like the love I felt from that for them was so overwhelming that it gave me a better idea of how my parents felt about me or how God felt about mm -hmm. me, which gave me more love for myself. Yeah. Um, that's such a beautiful, a beautiful lesson to learn. Um, something else I loved about your book is when you talk about the breath. In this passage I wanted to read, you say, for even when we haven't yet seen the other side of the issues that we're facing, we are still worthy of breathing deep and knowing peace right here amid them. And I have to say, sometimes when I'm under stress, I literally forget to breathe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you ever do that? Yes. Like you find you realize you're just yes. like holding your breath. <laughs> Tell us more about why breathing is so important in finding peace and how how we can be more mindful about yeah. our breath. Is there is there a way that we should be practicing breathing? Yes, yes. It's it's really interesting because I'm not sure that this exact story made it in the book, but it's a part of the architecture of what led me to talk about that. And growing up, my sister and I had asthma, and I don't know what what like, I don't know if they still have these machines or what they were even called, but we called it the breathing machine. And like a nebulizer? Yes, yeah, there you go. Okay, <laughs> so, there you yeah, go. I'm going off, like, we just <laughs> called it the breathing machine. I love it. I know and what you're talking about. That, yeah, so it was fascinating because we would, and me and my sister, we would get so excited about taking turns with the breathing machine. And, you know, my mom would sit us down and we would each take our turn. And it was interesting because in that moment, you know, I didn't know anything about mindfulness or, you know, slowing down and taking deep breaths or meditation or anything. I just knew that I needed to breathe and I needed to slow down and take a mm -hmm. moment to breathe. And I feel like in many ways I've carried that practice with me just as, as a, I carry that image with me just as a reminder that taking a moment to breathe does not always have to be set in a you know, de designated time of the day where you're sitting down and you're only just breathing. That's absolutely mm -hmm. beneficial. And there's tons of research around that. And at the same time, because our current world, is just so busy and so chaotic, 
just taking one deep breath is a feat. And Mm -hmm. that's just something that I, I really truly stand on. I'm like, yes, I absolutely think that it is important that we take additional time to just breathe and turn off all the devices and do that. But I also think that it starts with just, can you take at least one deep breath right now and see what that does? And just try to do that at least once a day. And it's yeah. very, it's, it's a very simple thing that is not revolutionary in any way. <laughs> well, but I have the, this, yeah, I have this little reminder on my Apple watch that will pop yes. up and say breathe. And every time it goes up, I'm like, oh my gosh, I needed that. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. yes, I'm breathing to sustain life, barely. But some that restorative, deep breath, we just, mm-hmm. we forget to do that. And it's so interesting because I know you're a musician. I'm a trained opera singer. Yes. And when we, when I first started, you know, really learning vocal technique, the first thing they teach you is diaphragmatic breathing. Mm-hmm. And everyone, it's like, it's a hard thing to, to grasp at first. And I remember my teacher saying, this is the way you were born to breathe. Like yes. when you are falling asleep, this is the way you're breathing. When you are a baby, this is the mm-hmm. way you breathe. But as we get older and we come under stress, we, we come away from that. We start yeah. breathing more and more shallowly. So mm-hmm. like I had, we had to learn, like, this is like vocal technique 101, learn yes. how to breathe. Um, and you know, as throughout the day, I literally forget, yeah. um, and so, yeah, yeah if you have absolutely. an Apple Watch, you can set a little reminder yes. or set a timer. Even. Yes. It's, oh gosh, yes. That's so, that is absolutely true. And I keep losing my Apple Watch. I've had like, I think I, I'm embarrassed to say how many <laughs> I've had and I lose them. So I got to work on that part, but you're absolutely right. And I I really think that that, that is absolutely a, a benefit of technology and finding different ways to use technology to to help you have those reminders is is super important. And I think it's kind of easy to overlook at times. Like another, another small thing that I've done that I started this about two years ago and I haven't changed it. I don't have any kind of social media easily accessible on my phone. Now, oftentimes it's still on my phone, but Instagram is like eight pages back. <laughs> mm. I make it hard to get to. Because just having that there where it's so quick and so easy to access, I just found that I would just a lot more be a lot more prone to just mindfully just, um, you know, scroll through. And one thing I noticed that when I'm on social media, I am a lot of times holding my breath. I'm taking shorter breaths Mm -hmm. because the nature of so much of what's on there is very short snippets. It's hard to really slow down and I digest things. Um, Like I've, I've heard people compare it to fast food and I'm like, I don't even think it's fast food because I mean, it takes it takes a minute to eat burger and fries. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was like shooting takes, a Red Bull. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, it takes a minute to like sit in the drive through and get the food and then eat it. I'm like, yeah, social media is not even that. It's much faster than that. So I, I just try to be mindful of that. And it's it's such a small thing, but I've managed to keep it up for two years now and I haven't changed it. And I've noticed that my screen time has gone down. So yeah, I, I think it, it for me it just kind of goes back to just really asking ourselves like what what small thing can I do? Yes, the big things are great. Like there are books and people who are like, here's how I got rid of all my social media and mm-hmm. here's what my life looks like. And that's wonderful. And at the same time, if you can just make a Put small a little friction shift, in there. Exactly. Yeah. It it makes such a difference. Yeah. Well, we're coming into the most beautiful time of the year with the holidays and all of the hustle and bustle. And as wonderful as it is, um, it's ironic that it can also be one of the most stressful times of the yes. year. You know, <laughs> the time that we're supposed to be celebrating peace on earth, but yes. with all of the decorating and entertaining and yes. gifting and gathering, yes. often there's a lot of extra stress. Do you have any specific strategies for practicing peace during the holidays? You know, I think that, you know, for me, sometimes it's a a little bit tricky with the holidays for me because I'm someone who any type of like social gatherings take a lot of work for me. Just being autistic, that is just, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to 
to just plan to be in a group of people where several conversations are happening. Like from a, mm-hmm. a sensory level, I'm if I'm in a room with several people and there's more than one conversation happening happening at once, because I have a sensory processing disorder, I'm hearing every conversation at the same volume equally. Mm. So it takes a lot of effort to just focus and be present to the person in front of me and to actually like move my way through the room just in a very literal sense. So because I, I have to spend so much time on that, a lot of my sort of, um, I guess you would call practices around the holidays are just really simple things. And it's just a lot of it involves like this may sound so like anticlimactical, but it involves saying no. Um, no, no, I I, I love can't that. do that. Um, or I can't do that, but I can do this. For instance, I just got invited to something that and I was looking at the calendar and I was just like, Yeah, that's I don't have enough recovery time. I, I love these people. I wish I could go. Um there, there's a whole social part of me that's like, I feel like I should, yeah. but I just know I'm already looking at the calendar. I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, but I was like, you know, I really care. So let me help them with the invitation. So I help with the invitation and I, and I was like, here's, you know, here's how you can send it digitally. Da, 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 da. Mm. And it ended up having like a really meaningful uh, impact. And, and I ended up being a contribute in a way that I could. And there is in a lot of ways, you know, when you make those decisions to do those kinds of things, there can be risk there. There, there yeah. might be some people who legitimately feel, even though you may know your capacity, they may feel like, well, you could have done more because you did X, Y, and Z. But for me, it's about knowing what I can do and being at peace with that and being at peace at the end of the day saying, I know that I showed up for that person, for these people, for this cause in the way that I could. At the same time, some people may think it's not enough. Some people may think it was more than enough, but that's not, I can't be the one to decide that. That's on them how they decide to receive it. But what matters is that I know that I gave what I could. And that's where I try to take that exhale and just say, yeah, I I did what I could do. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's a lot of, of what this season um, has been looking like for me. And I'll just say even further to anyone else who's either introverted or maybe also neurodivergent or some, some, you know, combination of that, or you may have something else that keeps you from maybe being able to physically, you know, be present the way that people may expect you to. I think that that's where creativity is. It's just such a beautiful thing. It's like, cause we all have ways that we can, be present to other people that other people may not think about, but they end up appreciating. So it's like, if you're someone who is an artist or designer or illustrator, it's like, yeah, somebody may not, somebody may more naturally say, Hey, can you bring the mashed potatoes? (laughs) Maybe say, no, actually I can't, but I'm actually really good at, at getting beautiful photos printed out of the family and having them displayed. So can I do that? And mm-hmm. I've just been finding that surprisingly people are like, oh yeah, I actually didn't even think of that. So that's something that, that I'm very hopeful about is that, you know, that myself and other people who may have similar, deal with similar things that we can all find like our own way of, of being involved and, and contributing. And yeah. I think that's such a good reminder to all of us to, to know your limits and know, yes. be a, have the confidence to say no, but then also to not expect everyone to show up the way you would show up, you know, yes. assume the best, assume that everyone's doing the best they can and not, mm. don't be so easily offended. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> such great advice. I really do want to hear more about how you discovered you had autism. Mm -hmm. You start your book with this passage in the preface. You say, for most of my life, I lived with undiagnosed autism. I spent years living with a struggle without a name. Throughout daily life, a pendulum in my mind swung back and forth between these two thoughts. I think there's something wrong with me and I need to figure out what to do with myself. And I think something's wrong with me and I need help. When I was 27, I finally had just enough courage to ask my primary care doctor for advice on pursuing an autism diagnosis. And honestly, as I read that, um, I realized those are kind of questions I asked myself too. And a year ago, um, it led me to a doctor and a diagnosis of ADHD, which, you know, I'm a highly functioning person, 
that did, had no idea this was something that I had been struggling with, but it did create this level of awareness that has been a gift for me and how kind I am to myself and also how I'm able to see other people and what they might be challenges they might be struggling with. So I'm curious, can you share what finally gave you the courage to pursue a diagnosis and what was that process like for you? Yes. Yes. Um, such a good question. What I think the thing that it it, it was, was just, you know, (laughs) just cycling through that same sort of overwhelm and just feeling like I couldn't keep up that, um, I, I, I've dealt with in many different points of my life. And I think what was, what was key about age 27 for me was just that I was recognizing that, oh, I'm really not a kid anymore. And I feel like I should have grown up more by now. I feel like I should have my life together more than I do. And even though I was doing a lot, I was, I was doing tons of freelance work at that time and just trying to piece it all together. I just felt like I wasn't quite just maybe connecting with other people in a meaningful way. Like I would have, and I have so many different variations of this story of like on a social level, I would have friends that I'm like, oh yeah, we're friends. And then a lot of my friends like would start getting married and I would be surprised that like, oh, they never asked, they didn't ask me to be a part of the wedding party. And I thought we were closer than that. Mm -hmm. And I would just be very curious about that. And I'm just like, you know, what, what did I do wrong? I thought I wasn't even so much like offended by it. It was just like a, noticing patterns of I don't know if I'm as close to people as I thought like maybe I don't have as many friends as I thought and it would would happen professionally as well I would I would apply for things and then I would hear back oh we went with someone more qualified and it was just so many different versions of that and what would happen is that I would always put it on myself I'm like well I must there's something going on with me that I need to fix. So, you know, it's, it's, if you Google anything like that, you know, you'll see, oh, seek out professional help. So that's what I did. I was like, okay, my closest professional help person is my primary care doctor. So let me just ask him a question and help. Maybe he can help me figure out what goes next. Um, That did not happen. He looked at me and said, um, and I was like, yeah, I think just based on what I'm dealing with socially and just trying to keep up with my life, you know, I, I just, I think I could be, you know, on the autism spectrum. I was like, I just want to talk to someone. I was like, I don't even know if that's what it is. I just want to talk to someone. And he didn't even look at me. He just kept looking at his clipboard and he was just like, you're perfectly normal. You have nothing to worry about. And he was like, if Mm -hmm. you, if you were autistic, you would have, you know, you would have other things going on. And I was just like, you I've seen you like three yeah. times. Like you don't even yeah. know me like that. But sadly, you know, he's the one in the white coat. He's the one who studied. I just took his word for it. And I was just like, well, I guess I'm the problem then. Like, I guess I've got to figure it out. So um, I just sort of retreated for a while. And it wasn't until the pandemic that I think a lot of those things that those those issues were always there. Those questions were there. But I think I just stopped feeling like I could ask about them. And it was during the pandemic where everything slowed down. I think it was just a lot more in my face (laughs) of just like, yeah, all that stuff that you struggle with. And I just noticed during the pandemic, just how being at home, I mean, we, we, we work from home. So just being at home all the time, I felt like I had more just time to sleep. I felt, I felt more rested, even though there was this like, restlessness going on at large I did also feel just like a whole world of navigating other things I didn't have to navigate I I just felt a little bit more free in a sense so it was like what is that this just feels different and I, I know it's different for everyone but I'm like I think there's something going on here and it was around that time that I started seeing TikTok videos actually of, of oh, yeah, different that's a TikTok pe- yeah. blew up over- <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. of of different adults who were talking about their autism diagnosis as adults huh. like I don't I think it's because I, I follow a lot of like mental health or just you know mental health related things neurodivergent related content so eventually it just started showing me that and I was like oh wait a minute um <laughs> that sounds wow. like me because what a lot of people don't know and even a lot of practitioners don't really have 
don't all have experience with this is that autism looks very different in adults. Um, autism looks very different in women. Autism looks very different in, in black people. So there isn't really a lot of research out there uh, to really show what, what someone like me, what autism would look like. And it's, it's becoming, thankfully, there's more research being done and there's more people talking about their experiences. But it, yeah, it, it was through TikTok that I was able to find people like me. And from there, I think I literally heard someone say, they're like, you have to find someone to talk to who has experience with autistic adults. They're like, that's a very key factor. So that's what I did. And I was able to find specialists who saw autistic adults. And that was what led me on several month journey of just sitting with a specialist who was able to really kind of evaluate my whole life. And yeah. Yeah. So you, throughout your life, you you knew you had challenges and you found Mm -hmm. ways to to cope with those challenges. Was there something like a big aha when you finally got the diagnosis that ended up like revealing this blessing. Yeah. Like, you know, also often our challenges in hindsight can, can, we can see how it was a blessing in our life. I'm I'm curious what that was like. Yes. It, it felt like for me, and and I've been trying to find the right language for it for a long time, like since I got the diagnosis and I think I'm finally getting there and that it felt like I had been speaking a language to other people that they were, you know, that I was fluent in, but they knew a little bit of, so there's a little bit getting through, but I didn't know that they weren't fluent. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. and now it's like, Oh, wait a minute. I communicate in a completely different way. It's practically a different language. That's why maybe there were communication differences between people that I thought were close friends. Um, you know, I, that's why, you know, I, if if it was a work opportunity that fell through, I I just, I presented myself in a completely different way. And some of the specifics of that is, you know, a lot of, um, you know, and and of course, you know, autism is a spectrum. So I'm definitely not speaking for everyone's experience, but um, you know, I'm, I'm a very bottom up thinker. Like, I don't really think about like, okay, here's a topic. And then let me fill in the topic. For me, it's like, life is just like a, like a billion little pieces and I'm yeah. just constantly moving through all the little details. So even if I was just like presenting um, an idea to like work with a collaborator, like I'm like, Oh, I, I'm not even, I don't start with like the overall theme. And I was like, yeah, people may not understand you if you're speaking that way. So just tons of little things like that. I, yeah. I was just like, Oh, it's just an, entirely different way of communicating. (laughs) I was like, it explains so so much. So now I feel like I'm able to be a bit more direct. I'm able to say, I'm like, Hey, here's how I communicate, but let me know if I need to communicate this differently instead of blaming myself. I literally found an email that I sent when I was in college. I found this like two days ago. I was in a group project and I had done all the work <laughs> for the mm-hmm. group project and I was sending it to everybody inside of the group. And I was like, okay, everyone, I've got all your, here's your index cards. And I put everything on theirs and then here's the video. And then you're going to read this. I, I just, I did the whole assignment. And then <laughs> someone responded and, and the, the guy who responded, he was just like, yeah, I've been busy with work. I haven't been able to you know, be a part of the group project. And that was all he said. And then after that, I apologized. I apologize oh in the email and said, I'm so sorry uh, if I didn't communicate this correctly. Like, you know, let me know if I need to make any adjustments so that, you know, you can add your part in. And I was like, why was I apologizing? And I was like, oh, it's because I didn't know that, okay, the this way that I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the group project in the sense of every little thing that needs to be done. And I was like, okay, no one started it yet. So let me just do it all. And then everyone else will do their little parts. And just recognizing, wow, how many more moments in my life have I been apologizing just when it was just a difference? It was just a different way. So, yeah, Yeah. it's been a lot of realizing that and and recognizing that that's okay. It's okay to be different. It's okay to to be different without always apologizing for yourself. And that goes for anything, for 
an autism diagnosis, Absolutely. literally anything, mental yes. health, yes, yes, yes. just different political points of view. Like you can just be who you are and you don't have to apologize for it. Um, we need to be kind, but yes. be ourselves. Um, so beautiful. Okay, so in addition to all of the amazing things that you do, we didn't even talk about your music, by the way. Go <laughs> listen okay. to Morgan yeah. on Spotify. It's amazing. Um, you have an app as well. I do, it's called I do. Yes. Storyteller. Yes. And yes. I have been loving it. Oh, so thank much you. good searchable content there. Oh, but my favorite yes. part is the journaling prompts. Yes. I mean, oh, I so believe glad. there is power in writing things down. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear why you think journaling our story is so important. Yes. Oh my goodness. I, so kind of, you know, even just along this similar theme of what I was just sharing about communication, one thing I have found in, I've been journaling pretty much my whole life. I mean, I have journals as early as when I was eight years old, I still have them. And one thing that I have found is that there's a certain way that it's like, even if, you know, you and I right now, we're speaking English with each other, but there's a certain way that we form sentences or tell our story that's different from each other. And this is true even if you have siblings and you all had very similar experiences. Like there is a, a childhood story that you tell slightly differently than your siblings. And there's so many different versions of that. And journaling is a way of, of just honoring your way of telling a story, of your way of remembering. And and recognizing that that's okay, because as time goes on, we remember things differently. As time goes on, we, we forget things. Yeah. And having, taking that moment to just write something down, it, chances are in that moment, it is not going to feel like much. But just like I'm learning so much about that email that I sent that I still have mm -hmm. from, I don't even know how many years ago, it's like, oh, it, it reveals to me what I was going through then. And those are lessons that still impact me now. So yeah, the journaling feature is actually really new. We've been working on it for a long time and it's finally live. And you can actually use like the actual journaling feature in the free portion of the app as well. And I really wanted to have that there because I just think that it, it's getting harder and harder for so many people to remember that they too have something to say it's like if yeah. you're just constantly being bombarded with headlines and posts and emails and stuff that you have to do just all day long it's so easy to just feel like well I guess I'm just a number I guess I'm just yeah. you know so yeah I think that journaling can help us it's like this way of remembering and just honoring you know our way of telling a story and discovering who you are, because yes, like you said, yes, we're yes. bombarded by headlines and notifications and everyone else's mm -hmm. content that we can just go day to day to day, just consuming what everyone's throwing at you. But what I found, you know, as I've been following some of your journaling prompts, is it, it kind of creates space to think like, what do I feel? Like, how am mm -hmm. I feeling? Like, what am yes. I going through right now? Because sometimes I know I don't even check in with myself because I'm just so busy in, yeah. in the grind, you know? Yeah. Um, and I've been an on and off again journaler through the years. And occasionally I'll pull out one of my old journals, like when I was a young mother. I have seven kids now, by awesome. the way. My oldest is 26. <laughs> youngest That's is 14. Awesome. Um, and, you know, we're going through some hard stuff with parenthood. Spoiler alert. It doesn't get easier as they get older. <laughs> but I have found so much strength by going back and reading my older journals as a younger mom. Mm -hmm. um, and just that version of myself is just like I find greater love for myself and compassion yes. for what I've been through and what we're going through. Um, journaling can be a huge gratitude practice too, you know, yes. taking a time to recognize the blessings in our life and, yes. and write it down. And actually over the years I've gotten, I'm not as good about actually sitting down with a pen and writing in a book. I, I jot notes down on my phone, but I also take a lot of photos kind of yes. like my photo journal. Yeah. I know I mentioned that everyday magic is something we talk a lot about at chat books. And for me, what that looks like is as I go through my day, anything that pricks my heart for mm. like makes me swoon or feel grateful, or even like sometimes riles me up a little bit, may, might make me a little angry, like yeah. <laughs> a pile yeah. of laundry that nobody has bothered to fold. Uh, snapping a picture for some reason, it just helps like 
elevate the mundane. It helps me see Mm -hmm. the beauty in some of the chaos. And there's nothing I love more than going back through my chapbooks where I, you know, capture all, hold on to all of these little magical moments and remember like all of the blessings of my life. And also like how we've navigated through some of the inevitable hard things Mm -hmm. of life. Yes. Yes. So Morgan, I'm wondering if that thought of everyday magic, is there a magical moment that you have captured of your family recently that you could share with us? Yes. Yes. I am so proud of it. Uh, it's, um, we were getting ready to go, uh, we were getting ready to go to my, uh, celebrate my brother-in-law's birthday. And it was just like a rare moment where everybody just looked really groomed. And <laughs> we were all I'm like, oh, look at us. Like we're all dressed up and color coordinated. And it was right in the middle of fall. All the leaves were just full color. And we were walking out the front door and I was just like, I got to go get my tripod. And I just got my tripod, set up my phone on the timer, and we just took this family portrait. And mm. it's, I think it's, I think it's my Facebook photo right now. And I was just so proud of it <laughs> because mm. it was just, it required slowing down to see like that moment for what it was because we were, we were on the way to something else. And I was just able to slow down just enough to see, oh, here's one of those moments. You're going to want to get this, take the extra time to go get the tripod, even if it makes us a few minutes late, it's worth it. And I, I was just so grateful for that because surprisingly, it's just, yeah, as, as, as I get older, I guess I just think to do that less. Yeah. So it was just really magical for me because it was like, oh, that's still there. It's like, I was definitely doing that when I was in college and my early twenties and that, that magic was still there. I was still able to slow down and, and capture that. It was really special. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, okay. You're a photographer too. So I'm wondering, <laughs> I, I'm not a professional photographer, but by the looks of my camera roll, you might wonder yes. how many, do you know how many photos you have in your camera roll? Yeah. Let's have look. You, let do us you have your photos? See, I do. I do. It's, um, it's, oh wait, that's just the favorites. 120,962. <gasps> Holy, you literally <laughs> doubled mine. I have 55,000 oh, and wow. I've got, I have a problem. A <laughs> hundred. Okay. So you are the right person to ask them. Yes. Do you have any life hacks for organizing that camera roll so that you can actually Ooh. enjoy some of those favorite family memories? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So there is, so I have an iPhone and so this may differ mm-hmm. for people who don't have an iPhone, but um, one thing I love is it's, it's actually not on the phone, but I, I make a practice of doing this. So one, I'm sorry, let me back up favorites. I don't, yes. I thought everybody used favorites, but apparently that's not a thing. So we got to talk about really? that more. <laughs> like, yes, no, I, that is a great I tip. was, so, yeah, I was talking with like some other creatives and they were like, how do you keep track of your favorites? I was like the favorite feature, like use the heart, <laughs> but not everybody does that. So I learned that this year. So that one we'll put that Hot out tip. there is use that and then the second thing is and I, i'm sorry if anybody from apple is listening but i do not like the photos app on the computer i'm sorry it stresses mm-hmm. me out i don't get it i'm not ready to sync everything in my phone right now i'm just trying to get a few pictures so i use this app that's called simple transfer and you can put it on your computer or in your phone and you can just plug it in like it's a good old fashioned hard drive and you just drag and drop those photos to your computer i use that at least once a week because oh, wow. it's just too chaotic in there <laughs> like yeah. i just don't i don't um i don't really organize that well outside of the favorites feature and it's especially useful for videos because if you start recording videos if it's like a they're adding all these features now where you know they can make the videos blurred background that stuff is really hard to just like text to yourself yeah. So I find that simple transfer app to be super, super useful. And the final thing I'll say that I yeah, use is this, um, is this app called Eagle that um, is only on my computer. But what it is my, my favorite feature is that it has a color palette. It takes the it takes it takes all your photos and you can search by color. So Ooh. you can, I have it for my artwork and yeah. my photos. I can click on like, uh, and it, it's not just like six or seven colors. It's the whole spectrum. So I'm like, I want this golden yellow. Show me all my photos with this golden yellow. And it's just like, uh, 
<laughs> it that shows just me all of it. So I your artist heart. Oh, I love it. So yes, I those are those are some of my favorites. So hopefully, well, those are two things I've never helps. heard of. I yes. am so glad that we had this chat, Morgan. Thank you. Yes, yes. I I love talking about that. So yes. Oh, amazing. <laughs> well, this has been such a pleasure to chat with you. Um, yes, likewise. Tell us really quickly, what are you excited about right now? I know you've yes. got pieces of practice, the book out. I saw online yes. that you have another book. You've literally had a book I, a year <laughs> since yeah, you started writing. <laughs> yeah, it's been wild. Uh, it's been a lot of books, a lot of books out there. Um, I put out a lot of things and, and I do love working on books. But yeah, right now I'm excited about going back to school. I'm going to grad school in January. It's, it's something that I've just been wanting to do, wanting to go back to. And I am so excited. Like I'm just like, ordering the books, getting everything ready to go. I'm awesome. studying for, uh, it's an MFA in interdisciplinary media arts. So it's just like a combination of all the things I do. And it's like, this is a perfect program. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I love it. And it's never too late to yes, follow your dreams. Of course, never too late. Never too late. Incredible. All right. Well, we got to wrap this up, but I just wanted to ask one more question and yes. preface it by saying one of my favorite sections of your book was where you talk about community. And as women and mothers, a like-minded community can be such a blessing and yes. such a support. And my hope is that our mom force community is that for people because yes. we're all about supporting moms in this unique and yes. demanding phase of life. Yes. So to close, will you just share one of your go-to mom tips to yes. help us feel like we can, we've got this, we can do this? Yes. I think that mom friends... Is super important. I was, I think that that is just by far the most important thing is the community and the friendship. And I think it's one of the hardest things. Yeah. So I think that spending time on figuring out who your people are, who can you text, who can you, you know, just catch up with on FaceTime, like even if you're not seeing each other on a regular basis, if, if you're doing that, I think that that is by far like one of the most important things that you can do um you know i think that of course there's a benefit that we have so many things going on in the world with technology and all of that but i think sometimes it can still just feel very isolating and lonely and we can forget that people as people were meant to be a part of a community like we're not all just like separate people with separate profiles that you know follow like whatever it's like no we're part of a community of people. So yeah, I was, I was blessed enough to have, um, my sister and I got pregnant at the same time. <laughs> our oh, kids, fun. our kids are a week apart. My son's a week older. My sister's two years younger than me. And I would say that like that relationship has just been oh, priceless. I'm like, yeah. we get it. We get it where we go through all the same phases together. Um, and it's, and it's just so good to have that. And and most of, I would say that most of my other closest mom friends, they actually aren't, the next closest one is an hour away. Um, and the next closest one is an hour and a half away. So it's like, we don't even see each other all the time, but just knowing that they're there and knowing that we can have those conversations together makes such a difference. So I think yeah. that that's something worth pursuing and yeah, just work on who your community you on is. Are you on Marco Polo? Do you ever use Marco Polo? I did for a while. And then we we fell off. That was me and my sister's thing for a long time. But now that you say that, I'm like, why? Why do we stop doing it that? It's so great. It's such a yeah. brilliant way <laughs> to stay in touch, especially if you have like, you know, if you like to communicate on your own terms, on yes. your own time. Yes, yes. Um, I need to more. I need to bring that back. I don't know why we stopped, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you will love it. It is it has yes. been a huge blessing for me yes, um, yes, yes. keeping in touch with my with my sisters who some yes. don't live near me and yeah. friends reconnected with friends. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like an interactive a Instagram story, but just like yeah. with people you know. It's so great. You feel like yeah. you're literally just sitting there with your friend chatting. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yes. We all need that. Okay. I'm going to so. send my sister Marco Polo today. And do it. <laughs> just be like, hey, why don't we stop using this? Like, <laughs> I might hunt you down and send you a Marco Polo too. Yes. Because this has yes. been such a great chat. I have loved learning from you throughout the years. I've loved, loved having you here and mm, being able to share you. some of your light with our community. Where can people find you and all of the incredible, amazing things that you're doing? 
Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's, it's been such an honor to be here. Yes, so I am Morgan Harper Nichols pretty much everywhere. Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, and my website, MorganHarperNichols.com. It has all my books and my app and all that good stuff. So yeah, that's where you can find and me. And you have a podcast. I and do. And you got to go to Spotify. <laughs> go listen to her yes, music. Yes, yes. And that it launches was... again in January. So I have that coming soon. Um, I had to take a little break for a little while, but it'll be back. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.